So our second talk this morning is from Professor Kim Hardy from Nottingham University. And uh, it's about microscopy and microbiology, uh, moving forward together. So please join me well, welcoming <laughs> Professor Hardy. So th thank you very much. It's good to have an invitation and a nice introduction. And I'm a microbiologist, so I'm hoping to take you through the green side here and help you find out a little bit more about how we've moved from believing there might be an invisible life form to seeing it and actually believing it properly because we had some proof and then seeing it even better every time we looked until we started to understand it and then use that information to prevent infections and now we're moving on to look at these microbes in their own natural habitat as they're really living and to track them and their functions as they're beginning to take over. So but all of that was only possible because we had things that were able to make us be able to see the, mic the microorganisms, and that's the microscopes. So in parallel with us seeing that in microbiology, the microscopes have evolved from being light microscopes through electron and fluorescent microscopy, and we've improved them in having less background, more depth, getting into 3D, and then telling us different functionalities. So where did it all begin? Because there was the idea that things existed that we couldn't see way back in the 6th century BC, <coughs> with the Jain philosophers um, believing in different kinds of life forms and categorizing them depending on how many senses that they had. And they did have one, the echindria, which had only one sense. And they said that those were microorganisms that couldn't be seen through the naked eye. They also had nigodas, who they said were tiny um, living um, creatures that were everywhere. So that was the idea that there were some microorganisms. And then a Turkish scientist in 14th century um, was able to um, say that there were seeds that were very small, that cannot be seen, but they were definitely alive. And all of that was the basis. And at the same time, we, could, um, we can see that they had theories about infectious diseases. So it started off with thinking that there was bad air or miasma everywhere that made us ill. And then that became the germ theory, which says that single um, things in the air cause specific kinds of diseases. So a single germ made a single disease. But without seeing it and seeing this transfer, they had no proof. So in parallel with that, they were beginning to magnify things. In ancient Chinese um, culture, there was water tubes, so these are tubes which had a lens in them with some water on top, and they could change the amount of water on top and get different magnifications, and they went up to 150 times. And that was 4,000 years ago. And then the Greeks, the Romans, and the ancient Egyptians all were using um, curved lenses, and in the Greeks, and with Aristotle, as we've heard about, he was using those in surgery. But throughout that, there's no actual recordings of any microbial sightings. Until we get to um, 1646, when a Jesuit priest, um, Alphantius Kircher, who crucially was a projectionist, so he was familiar with lenses, so probably a better craftsman, craftsman and so was able to actually bring things into focus and see them. And he describes in Milk and Vinegar seeing abundant, um, innumerable multitude, so lots of tiny things. And it wasn't until we had this observation that we could really start to think that there was an entity there, and that would be the start of microbiology. So... The microscopes and also telescopes to see up into the, uh, into the skies 
were sort of evolving together, getting better and better at mag mag magnification and resolution. There were spectacle uh, makers in the 14th century in Italy, and it was spectacle lens makers that started to take the microscopes forwards. So Hans and Jacarias Janssen, who were Dutch spectacle makers, made a tube with a lens in, and they also made tubes with two lenses in. So when they have two lenses, we call that a compound lens or a compound microscope. But the actual word for microscope came in when, um, you can see down at the bottom here, we've got Giovanna Faber in 1625 describing a compound microscope, so that's one with more than one lens, that was invented by Galileo in 1609. And the word microscope is coming from two separate words, Greek words, for small and also for view, and putting those together. So now we're in the 1600s, and the microscopy has moved forward. But it's not going to go very far when we're just looking at bad air, and we can't grow the microorganisms, and we can't keep them from contaminating each other and be sure which one we're looking at. And these strides forward is how the microbiology went forward. And there were two um, men who were uh, sort of instrumental in this, Robert Hooke and Anthony um, Van Leeuwenhoek. So these overlapped, and Robert Hooke was the first to write about seeing a fungus. So this is a kind of microorganism, and so that counts as uh, within this um, history through microbiology. He was using a, three, a, a microscope containing three lenses, which was made of gold and leather, and which you can see up there on the slide. And it had a candle which was creating the uh, light and was able to magnify 50 times. And he was the first person who was able to, who, who coined the term cells. And he drew pictures by hand and published them in his micrographia. And then at the same time, um, Anton van Leeuwenhoek was around. He was in, um, he was a tradesman who had the superior craftsmanship to make the lenses even better. And he was able to create a, a, a microscope which, was a, which magnified uh, 300 times. It only had a single lens, and it's a small handheld thing, which you've already <laughs> seen one photo, uh, picture of, but I'll show you a picture on the next slide. And it's Anthony van der Hock who's actually got the name of being the father of microbiology because he was the first to see um, bacteria and he wrote um, more than 200 um, letters to the Royal Society, which were peer-reviewed by Robert Hooke um, at the time. And, and he did his microscope so well that they were not surpassed for over 150 years. But what they established conclusively is that people could see these microorganisms and therefore study them further. So here he is holding his little microscope up to his eye. And this is like the picture that you saw before. And you can see that you've got, it's only about five by five centimeters. It's two metal plates. And at the top, the red label says where the lens is, which has been superiorly um, crafted to give really good magnification. And you can also see where the specimen is put on the top of the pin. And I'll point out to you the two screws underneath, which are what are used to adjust the position of the specimen so that it's really nicely able to be seen. And on the right here, you can see some pictures that he drew in one of his letters to the Royal Society of some of the organisms that he's seen, which are quite realistic to what we actually see today. So one of the things he looked at was the plaque from his teeth, from his mouth, and that's known, I think we know why we wash our, our, brush our teeth, because there's lots of microorganisms in there. And he saw... Um, some bacteria very prettily are moving in his spittle, which I thought was very nice, and particularly one that looked like a pike um, going through some water. 
And hopefully you'll agree that's what they really look like when I show you the videos later. So that was a bit of microbiology going on. If we come back to our mi microscopes, how are they now evolving? And when is this happening? Well, we're now in the 1730s. And we've got Charles Hall putting two lenses, so that's a compound microscope, into a tube. But he's made the change of making one of them a different shape. And when he's got one a different shape with different reflecting properties, he's able to align the colours better without affecting the magnification very much. Then Joseph Lister, in 1830, was looking at the distance between two lenses. And he worked out that you could get a precise distance and then stop the uh, light bending at different angles um, depending on where it hit the lens, and that improved your image quality. So that was all good things. And then you've also got the actual use of the microscope getting better. So Ernst Leis was able to put more than one um, tube of lenses in a revolving turret on a microscope. And I've got a picture to remind you of what that looks like in a bit. Um, and then, as well, parts of the optics were improving. So Ernst Abe, who worked for what, uh, Carl Zeiss, one of the big companies that's still going today and who we still buy our microscopes from, um, he designed his microscopes based on mathematical modelling. And the good thing about that is that it makes them... Um, really accurate every time. It removes the trial and error of all the looking for things and making sure that they're in focus. And he also uh, worked on the first immersion lens. So that's where you take your sample on its slide and you put your lens into some liquid above it and that gets rid of some of the refraction that can distort the images. Alongside, as well, there were machines coming because one of the things in microscopy is that you have to pass the, the light through your sample. So if your sample is too thick, then that's not very easy to do. So a machine called a microtome, which is able to cap very thin slices, started to be used for the sample preparation um, when we were observing. And then the other thing I wanted to point out was cola illumination happening in the 1893, uh, where August Kohler, again working for Zeiss, he invented the double diaphragms, which provides um, uniform il illumination. So when you've got really good steady illumination, you've got a bright image and minimal glare, which improves the detail of what you can see. So I'm sure you've all seen some sort of microscope modern. And that's one that I've got hold of, just so that I could point out where the five, where the objectives are on the turret, which can revolve around and make everything easier. We've now got our stage, which is where you put your sample. And then underneath, we've got a diaphragm and a condenser, which is what I mentioned being discovered on the previous side, and then at the bottom, you've got the light source. And crucially, on this side, you've got these two buttons called coarse focus and fine focus, which are basically two screws moving your sample around, just like um, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek had. So, um, what's happening next? We're at the 19th and 20th century, and We've got quite good microscopes, but we really need our samples to be um, good and pure and definitely have microorganisms in them. And we also need to start to understand a bit about how these microorganisms might be transmitted to cause infections. So along came Louis Pasteur, who I'm sure you've um, heard about in the 18... And in the 1860s to 70s, he was able to prove germ theory. So if you remember that there was this idea that a single organism causes a single infection. He got proof of that. And one of the things that was a step along the way was proving that this bad um, air that was around us um, actually contained things that were able to be transmitted from one person to another or one animal to another or one plant to another and it wasn't just spontaneous generation in the person who got ill. So he used these interesting looking um, 
flasks. So if you put some beef broth, which would grow a lot if it was contaminated by microorganisms and go cloudy, into one of these flasks and you heat it up, then you will kill all the microorganisms. When you've got this long, uh, bendy um, spout on the top, then the air can't get through it without things dropping out of it, and so it's sterile by the time it gets into your sample. And if you use a flask like that, it stays <coughs> clear, there's nothing growing on it, unless you break off the neck, and then the air can get directly into your broth, or you tip on the bottom line your flask up so that it touches the air and then you let it go back and then, then it will um, start to get cloudy, which means there's microorganisms growing in it. So there, Pasteur was able to um, uh, prove that spontaneous generation wasn't going on and that you were transmitting um, organisms from person to another person. And at the same time, to think about aseptic technique. So this is doing your experiments with microorganisms so that they don't just inadvertently get contaminated by other things that might be in the air. But in tubes like this, you can't see very well the individual organisms. You can't um, monitor very well when they get contaminated and when they don't. That was starting to be improved by Robert Koch in the 1880s. So, he was the first person able to grow microbes on solid surfaces when he actually wanted to. Everybody was probably growing them on their bread or their cheese or whatever, but they didn't know what they were doing. He grew on potato, and with um, Julius Richard um, Petri, they worked together to create the, the dishes you can see here, so the modern version and the original version, the modern one's been in plastic, the original in glass, which are a flat surface with a, an edge and then a lid with edges that go over the side. So our Petri dishes are still in use today. And the good thing about them is that you, while well, you're stopping the air getting in there because you've got that lip over them and it's not till you open them that they might get contaminated. And if you open them near a hot flame to keep the air moving up and away, nothing drops onto the surface and you keep your nice pure culture. And if you use your aseptic technique of burning whatever it is that you're inoculating before you pick up from one plate and put them to another, you keep them nice and pure. He developed on from the potato through to the agar we use today with the help of Walter Hess, who was also in his group. And the good thing about the agar is that it sets quite quickly. It's easy to melt so that you can and we melt them these days in the microwave, and then we can pour them into the dishes they set, and then they're ready for us to put our microbes on. Alongside growing them on the solid agar, so he could see um, the, the um, diversity of what might be in a sample, because they would all make different kinds of growing colonies on those plates, he was able to develop stains that were used in microscopy to help in the identification of certain ones or the visualising of them under the optics. And in so doing, he was able to come up with some postulates that, that have to be followed if you're talking about an infectious disease. And those are that the microorganism is always isolated from the person with the disease, but not from the person without, that um, you can grow it in pure culture and identify it. You can take it and put it into an undiseased person and that person will get the infection. And you can take from that experimentally infected person the same organism and have a look at it and um, identify it as being exactly the same. <coughs> So key to all of that, and showing that transmission goes from one person to the other and there are different microbes involved, is this staining to help us identify. And one of the big steps forward was in 1884 when Hans Christian Joachim Gram developed his uh, Gram stain. So you add a, various, a few steps of different uh, chemicals and that stains the bacteria and there are two main classes. 
you get either these purple ones, which we call gram-positive, or the pink ones, which we call gram-negatives. And those two main classes are one of the first identification steps that we do whenever we're looking at microbes. They're easy to do, they're very reliable, and they have a nice differentiation. So that was really useful for microbiology. So if we think about what microscopes have done so far for the microbiologists, it's um, helped them to show how um, germs are transmitted, so how infections are transmitted, and that is reliant on a live microorganism. It's also helping us to diagnose certain infections by growing them on our agar plates and using stains and microscopy to have a look at um, what they look like, what shape they are, how, what colour they come up in a stain. And then that is being applied in the 19th and 20th centuries to help us prevent infection. So as somebody mentioned, we've got the washing of the hands and sterilising of surgical equipment, um, reducing the amount of people who are dying and catching infections. And you will have remembered that coming to the forefront during the pandemic. Um, we also have Pasteur um, bringing in the pasteurization of food to stop people getting ill from contaminated food. And we have, as well, the de development of the first vaccines to pretend, prevent people from getting infected in the first place. And that has all been enabled because we have the microscopes. But by uh, 1900, the visible light microscopes had reached the limit of their resolution, so how well they can see something in focus, which is 200 angstroms, or a magnification of 500 to 1,000 times. So the microbiologists needed new things. In 1904, Zeiss brought in a UV or ultraviolet microscope, which had double the resolution of a visible light microscope. And then Fritz Zernicke brought in phase contrasts. So this is looking at the light in a different way, and it's able to view unstained cells, i.e. cells that are still alive, and then you can start to look at their behavior. And it uses the phase angle of, of rays, and it was introduced in 1941. And it's something we also still use today. So this is a video taken in one of our undergraduate lab practicals. And if you look very carefully, you can see on the bottom right some little bacteria going through water like a pike, maybe. Anyway, they're whizzing around, very happy. So that was nice. And, and a sort of variation on the theme is differential interference contrast, which is better than phase contrast and you, because it uses prisms, and that is also a lot in use these days. And these prisms are able to give even sharper images, so we can see even more detail. <laughs> but the next big step was probably the introduction of the electron microscope. So instead of visible light, you're shooting beams of electrons at your samples, and it was Max Knoll and Ernst Ruska who did that. And they had two different kinds. Transmission, so this is like the light, ones before it. It transmits the electrons straight through the sample. And scanning, which sends them across the top of the, the um, sample. And the beauty of this is we're now up to magnification of the times two million. A bit more than that. <laughs> so what can we see with these? So for the first time, we can see inside our microorganisms. So the inside of the cell is at the bottom of that image. And then you can see some lines, which I've, I've called OM and IM, for inner membrane and outer membrane. And those two come together as the cell wall of this bacteria. And crucially, we're starting to understand a bit about our microorganisms. So we've got one that has two membranes. That happens to be a gram negative. If we look at a gram positive, it only has one membrane. And that explains why one stains one way and the other one stains the other one way in gram stains. So we're not only designating just on 
colour, we actually are designating our different bacteria depending on their structure. Another thing that you, people saw were these hairs coming out of the top of their <coughs> um, cells. And at the bottom of the, ha the hair, especially in D, the bottom right of that, you can see some horizontal rings. And it's those rings that are uh, anchoring this um, hair into the cell wall. And we can understand it a little bit more because on the image on the right, it was stained up with little black dots, which are particles of gold stuck on an antibody that is able to recognize a specific protein, and that is flagellin. And that protein makes up flagellum, and that is our little propellers, our little rotating hairs that enable the bacteria to swim around like we saw in that movie a minute ago. So now we're coming to mechanisms from looking at bacterial behavior. So to give you an example of what the scanning electron microscopes could show us, this is a whole population of bacteria altogether. And you can see the, um, the rod-like things, that's a bacterium, and then all of those kind of fibers all around. And this we now know is the coordinated bacterial populations, or biofilms that we call them, that they make, this own, they make their own stuff around them, which is quite protective, and there's a lot of mechanisms going on behind the scenes there. But this was the first time that we saw anything going on. The next big strides were made by different, were enabled by a different form of microscopy, and that is, um, there were other forms of too, but what the fluorescent microscopy does is that if you see in this image, if the exciting light goes in sideways, there, it hits a mirror, goes through the objective lens to the sample, and that excites some compounds or fluorophores which send out light at a different wavelength, which goes back out, hits another, oop, hits another, hits another mirror, and then we detect that. And what we're also able now to do is instead of drawing them all by hand, we have cameras or digital, cam uh, digital screens to record the images, so we can watch movies over time. And here you can see some bacteria which have been filled with green fluorescent protein. And green fluorescent protein comes in lots of different colors, but what you can see here is the body is, um, is lighting up, and you can see the flagellum hair rotating behind it, propelling it around. And in this bottom one, we've stuck the end of the flagellum onto a glass side, which is going around, which makes the body then go around above it. If you use fluorescent stains rather than GFP, just fusions or inside the cell, you come to this series of, of pictures on the right-hand side. Um, and where you've pulsed in different colored stains at different times. So first the yellow, it makes the end of the flagellum, then the red, the next one, and then you can see the time course of the green bank being added, and the flagella is growing from the base on outwards to enable ro rotation later. Another thing that the fluorescence has enabled us to do is to track the death of the microorganisms. So this is going to help us in treatment, um, and you can see here in this video some bacteria which are making the green fluorescent protein and soon those lights are going to start turning out because we've added some antibiotic and that is dying. So we can use that to understand when we're killing, which cells we're killing, are we killing all of them. And not only that, we can do it in a population, in a biofilm. So at the bottom here, you can see we've got a channel at the bottom, and we've got an in and an out, and the videos here were showing what was going on in that channel. So the one on the right was showing the green fluorescence, which got steadily higher until the asterisk came on and it stopped because they were killed by the asterisk, which is actually um, an antibiotic, and at that same time, uh, there was a burst of red on the other side because a dye we had there was able to enter the damaged cells and, and turn the insides red, propidium iodide. 
The next step forward was to use the pinholes that we've heard of before and take our light through a pinhole, hit a mirror, into the sample, and then back and through another pinhole. And that means that we're only looking at a slice of light. And that reduces the amount of the background light, makes everything easier to see, more specific, with better resolution. And here you can see one of our biofilm um, cultures. So in this one, we've got the top. Ooh, sorry. We've got the top in the big square and then each side on the edge. And the little video was showing, I'll go back a slide, is showing each slice. And so it's dissecting the um, biofilm in different directions. And that is giving us the 3D view. So we're starting to understand how our bacteria form these biofilm cultures. And if we add antibiotics and use the confocal, we can see in the right, in the pink, they're dying more around the outside than they are in the middle, which makes sense because those would be the ones in first contact with the antibiotic. And this has been even more improved up to super resolution, which is able to see single um, molecules on the surface of the bacteria. And you can see here a number of different versions of this, which um, um, uses um, light and also it uses um, powerful image reconstruction to make even more better resolution. And here we've got an example down the bottom of where we can now see the outer wall or membrane of a bacteria with antibiotics in the middle, um, the purple on the right. And here we've got spots of single molecules all the way along the length of the bacteria. And if I show you this, this is the spots of the individual protein on the bacteria in a sort of spiral shape. And so we're nearly getting down to the fine detail of the microorganisms, and we can either introduce different fluorescent tags or make one fluorescent tag um, excite another one to look at interactions, or we can use the laser to um, stop the light and then see if it comes back, and that gives us dynamics. I think I'll skip over this one and go to where we really are today, which is to see if we can see the bacteria in their real life scenarios. So I've talked about on petri dishes and in broths, on slides, as single or populations, but really the bacteria are living in our skin, in our plants and wherever, and it's a complex 3D um, environment which scatters lots of light and then creates lots of background. So it's very hard to find our bacteria in deep tissues like that. So there's a couple of different ways. There's the multi-photon, which is brand new, which uses longer wavelengths than the shorter ones before. And they got over the fact that not many chemicals or fluorophores are excited by longer wavelengths by putting two photons at a time to excite them for a very, very short time. And because the uh, longer wavelength can go through the samples a bit further, it allows us to look deeper and they create less damage so we, can, uh, we get less photo bleaching and we can still see them. And, he, and we also have light sheet microscopy now where you can see in this bottom image here that the light is, is in one direction and in another direction you've got your objective lens looking at it. So you're not... You're not um, illuminating so much of your sample, and you can move that sheet through your sample and go deeper. And I've mentioned here the IC biofilm, which is one where you can add a chemical which has the same refractive index as the surrounding tissue, and that then sort of cancels it out, so then you can see your bacteria better. And importantly, because bacteria are so small and we're looking in a big context, I'm not finished, there are now ways where we can see the context of the bacteria as well as the small bacteria as well. So here we have um, um, two examples. The meso lens, which has a large um, objective with um, a small magnification, which enables you to do that. And another one, an image from our high, high content, which allows high throughput imaging 
and you do it both at, at two different scales, at super resolution and just a general magnification wide field. And on the left, you can see our wound dressing um, to give you context, and in the right, the super resolution with the little bacteria in green against the back of the wound dressing. And the last thing I wanted to mention was that as well as improving the microscopy itself, you can use it in combination. So here is an, an, an atomic force microscope, which is like stylus on a, a record player, has a very small nib, uh, which is smaller than a bacteria, and you've got the confocal lens below it. And so you, if you had, um, you can either look at forces with that stylus moving up and down, or you can drop things through it and then immediately watch what's happening to the bacteria below. Um, you can hold things with optical tweezers and look at them interacting. And you can also throw all your cells through a machine and a very fast population and you can see the fluorescence of each cell and its shape and take a picture of them at the same time. And the last thing to say is that you can also look at the metabolisms, what chemicals in each cell, by combining it with things like mass spectroscopy and Raman vibrational spectroscopy. And so, in conclusion, we are, <coughs> have been, we are still using microscopes with two screws to move our samples around, like Van Leerhoek did, but we've improved them to capture images in real time, um, to quantify from those images and to use machine learning to focus into specific bits to see it in high resolution. We can see single molecules in cells and we can dive deep into real samples. So we've proved that bacteria exist by seeing them. We've got the structure of them alone and in populations. We've understood how they're transmitted and how death, and we can track death. So we've got ways to get better prevention, diagnosis and cures. And finally, thanks. I'm sorry I've gone over slightly. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for questions. Uh, yes, that too. Yeah, we can start with the first close. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and then we. Go. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I was really intrigued by your very first slide. Seeing is believing. If I cannot see what you see, how do I believe it? Um, that's good. <laughs> I'm not sure where the question is. Can you not see what I saw? If I cannot see what you see, how do I believe it? Because what you tell me to see and what I see may be two different things. So you're putting oh. stuff up on the screen. So is it real to me or real to you? And how do we explain that? that I mean, it goes back to what the first person said about the exclamation, the intermission, what am I actually seeing that you're not seeing? Or you're... It's just a, a question that came up with your first slide. Thank you. Okay. I think we can just share what you're seeing and what I'm seeing and see if it's the same thing. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure. How long did the idea of invisible microorganisms persist before they were actually seen? And what originally provoked the idea that there were living, tiny things that couldn't be seen? Um, so I think there were unexplainable things back in the, you know, 4,000, 6,000 years ago, whatever it was, um, that they could see diseases happening, but they couldn't see the things that were transmitting them. And so I think that probably developed into the idea. Um, I don't know if they really couldn't see things at that time or they're just not recorded because they would have had to hand draw them and they would have been there very momentarily if they did see them with any of the rudimentary lenses. So we can only go from where they were actually properly published and recorded or either in writing the specific things or in in the Hook and the Van Leerhoek publications. Does that answer your question? Well, what I was thinking is that you know, those, 
there were poisons, for example, which are just chemicals. So what provoked the idea that they were living invisible things? Sorry, I missed that. I didn't Th that. There were poisons, which are just chemicals. Poisons, so, yeah. yeah. So what provoked the idea that these... Obviously, they could see that you know, diseases were transmitted somehow, but what made them think that they were living organisms? I, I expect... Bec I don't know for sure, because that's not the side I looked into, but I would say that they probably saw it amplifying... And that's where they got the idea. That's why Pasta had to prove between spontaneous generation and actually transmission. Does that explain it? A little bit. <laughs> Sorry. We have there a question, then we come back. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for your uh, nice uh, overview. Uh, just a question about the clarification and then perspective of the development. Right, that's, I'm just sorry about that, but um, yeah, I'm not a physicist, and that's what was written in the. <laughs> yeah, I should. But with super resolution, however, you can beat that limit and you go 10 nanometers and all this, and you have yeah. uh, shown a very nice overview. I'm just wondering also uh, what would be uh, the opportunity that uh, these methods uh, present for uh, the detection of bacteria and astronauts. Yeah, so one of the things that's going to do Yeah, so because we can see death happening in real time, we can start looking at, say, um, if we add one antimicrobial and then another, have we got additive killing or have we got deeper killing or have we got more of the cells killing? or anything to do with timing. And so we can begin some of that, and we can also use the high throughput to find new antimicrobials. And because we can look at the molecules and interactions now, and the metabolism and everything that's going on in the cell, we'll um, learn more about what those antimicrobials are actually doing. Because there are some generic things, whether it's some things like um, in wound dressings, that they don't actually know how they work. They just kill. So starting to understand how those things actually kill is going to help us either develop new ones or to use the ones we've got better. And then the things that are coming on stream with the machine learning and the artificial and, and that, um, intelligence is going to help us to take our big data that we're getting from all these videos and all these samples and try and see the patterns and try and predict what might come next or screen lots of things without... Um, having to spend so long doing it. So that's where I see us now, because we haven't had enough new antimicrobials. We might be able to use the ones we use now better, and we need to screen for more, and we haven't got enough manpower or person power to do it. So if the machines can do it, that will be fantastic. I totally agree with you. We're doing something similar. <laughs> so. We have a question there back row, and then... No, yeah. And then the Thank lady. You. <laughs> that was a fascinating another whistle stop tour. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, is heating an issue with illumination of biologic samples? Uh, and um, secondly, um, is laser light of any use here? Thank you. So, Lasers are used in some of the confocals, and they're moving to the, the LEDs, the light-emitting diodes, specifically for that reason. They, they, they emit less, less um, heat, so therefore you can look for longer. Yeah. Thank you. My question concerns uh, AI and the new algorithms that I know being introduced for big data and predicting antimicrobials. How do you ensure security? Because you're a UK university, and presumably there's global interactions on some of these things. But where, how is it going to be uh, policed? Or how, how much information do you have to keep for yourself? 
So this is an ongoing debate, and I think that it's becoming more and more evident that we're going to have to have good data security and also good ways of sharing it. The size of the data, where you store it, is the physicalities of that is, is getting to be a big issue. So that is something that is going forward under discussion. There will be, I'm sure, some... Um, regulations and standards and everything we'll have to comply with. And we have in our university a whole department called Trusted Researchers who look into exactly that, any international collaboration, what we're sharing, how we're sharing it, and where we're keeping things. And that should It's not universal at the moment. There's not any consensus. Each uh, research department will be protecting itself, presumably. There, there are laws and guidelines and stuff but people are only just realising mm. the magnitude of the implications. Mm. So they're trying to deliver them in the way that they think they should and could. But we need to collaborate to make that really good, I think. Thank you. More questions? We have one there. Uh, thank you. I was just wondering, we've come a very long way from the Chinese water tubes. Are we now focused on, for the future, improving the magnification, improving the resolution, and will there ever be a limit that we reach, perhaps with quantum effects? <laughs> I don't know if the... Well, we're going to get to the, see everything we can see. Um, I don't know. I think this combination is going to be really powerful. So looking at the molecules as well as what they're looking like and geographically dis, you know, placed in different places. So if you see one, one, one bacteria that can eat arginine, for example, or grow on oxygen, what is it next to? Can the one next to it do it? And then if you add an antibiotic, does it kill both of them? Those kinds of questions. And then you might want to know inside those which proteins or whatever molecule is doing the job. Um, we will always want to see more. <laughs> Thank you. And the last question. Uh, yes, there and John, the last. Can there. I first? <laughs> Could I, viruses. What's the best way of seeing viruses? You haven't mentioned, mentioned those. Oh, I didn't oh, mention them. They're, they're, they're very small, so uh, <laughs> even smaller than the bacteria I, show, I showed. Um, I it, Lots of different microscopy techniques, and yeah. I just was, just was wondering how, how the experts do that these days. They can look under EM, they can look under other sort of structural... Can you structural see ones. viruses moving? Well, do they move? <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know much about that. I mean, they, they, they... I know they're very small and they can move around the they, they would float but around. I don't know how they, how they actually... How they actually infect us? I'm, I'm a bit puzzled about how they actually go about it. Well, I should think they probably, I've not looked into it specifically, but I should think they probably tagged it with something fluorescent and they can see it floating around in things and moving from a cell to a cell. But like the bacteria having a propeller, I haven't come across a propeller, but they do have specific um, things that they like binding to. So if they were to move around and think, find that thing they want to bind to, so you need, a, you need to use an electron microscope, is that right? You need Sorry, to, what? You need to use an electron microscope to see a virus. Um, I think you do, don't you? I think you do. I'm not entirely sure if you, what you can see under the visible one, but they are okay. smaller than the bacteria, and we're only just seeing the bacteria. So <laughs> I'm making Thank an assumption you. there. And the last question here. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand a little on the mechanism of uh, fluorescing a bacterium and why is it that the moment the bacterium dies, that fluorescence disappears? What, what does it mean when a bacterium dies? So the particular ones that I was looking at is the green fluorescent protein. That needs oxygen and it needs the cell to be alive um, for it to make the fluorescence. So once the cell dies, some versions of them stop making the proteins, so the protein dies when it gets exposed to 
Because when a cell dies, it usually bursts open and, there's, and the stuff around it comes in. So the oxygen level will change. There may be something chemical that will um, make it fall apart in some way, and then it won't fluoresce. Uh, was, was that answer a question? Was there another bit? Yeah, so basically it's about the, the death of the cell, and it no yeah. longer produces the protein that fluoresces. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you very much for your time.